Everyone, can you hear me in the back? In the back row, can you hear me? Yeah, awesome. Great. Thanks so much for coming uh, to the first Bevin series lecture of February. My name is Cleo Wolfley Erskine. I'm an assistant professor of equity and environmental justice in the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs. And I'm very excited to be here this evening introducing um, our director uh, at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs, Terry Klinger. I'm sure most of you know her um, very well. But for those of you who, um, and if you're sitting in the, standing in the back and you want a chair, there actually are some seats down here in the front. So feel free to come down. Um, so Terry Klinger, for those of you who don't know her, um, is uh, the Barrett Professor of Sustainability Science and the director of our School of Marine Environmental Affairs um, here at University of Washington and co-directs the Washington Ocean Acidification Center. Her research focuses on the ecology of nearshore benthic systems, the impacts of multiple stressors on marine ecosystem function, and the development of management strategies to address the challenges of ocean change. Uh, she's a member also of the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel of the Pacific Fisheries Management Council and serves on many, many other advisory bodies. Um, she, her PhD is from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Uh, she has a, universe, uh, a master's degree in botany from the uh, University of British Columbia and a bachelor's degree in biology from UC Berkeley. So please, uh, and she'll be talking about the climate chemistry connection sustaining fisheries in an acidifying ocean. So if you wanted to hear about an acidified ocean, fortunately we're not there yet. So we're just acidifying. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Terry Klinger. Thank you. Let me get this um, arranged properly. Hmm. Probably not elegant, but can you hear me? <laughs> oh, where's the bell? I guess I'm on time. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks for being here. I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, not only not elegant, but not working. Um, I gotta try this one. Uh, thank you, Julia, for the opportunity to speak, and uh, thanks for all the organization that's been done. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, before, oh. oh, you're gonna do lights, good. Oh, I can do them from up here. Lights. How about, um, how's that? Yeah. How's that? Okay. <clears throat> you teach long enough, you can do anything. <laughs> um, so I'm not. I'm going to stay on my first slide for just a minute because it is a lesson both in chemistry and proofreading. And how often do you get that lesson <laughs> from one slide? Um, uh, the ocean is not acidic, and it won't be in our lifetime. And so uh, referencing an acidified ocean is uh, something that drives my colleagues in chemistry crazy. Um, I have struck that particular word from 100 documents, maybe more, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, Jan Newton has probably struck uh, that word from <coughs> 1,000 documents. Uh, so, um, number one, the ocean is not acidified. It's acidifying. It's moving towards pH 7, but it is not there yet. Um, and secondly, proofread your titles before they are broadcast. Hmm. <laughs> Got it. Um, my second slide, I'll start here. Um, there are, the work I'm going to talk about today touches on work that's been performed by many, many people um, and has been supported by many different entities. So on the side and bottom, you can see some of the folks, some of the entities that have contributed funding. Um, and I want to call out, besides individuals whose names appear on slides, I want to call out three teams that have really 
contributed to our work in the last couple years. The SMEA capstone team, that was a group of students. Um, and it was a really fruitful collaboration between SMEA and the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, another team we sort of euphemistically call the Schmidt team in reference to the funders. Um, and that's a really nice collaboration between a bunch of us here at UW plus others at UBC and the University of Connecticut. And thirdly, what we refer to as the JPB team, again, in reference to the funders. Um, and that is a collaboration between UW, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, and UC Davis. So the work I'm going to talk about today represents the work of many people or borrows from the work of many people. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, Here's the approach I'm going to take. I'm going to ask three questions and try and give you a little, try and provide inadequate and incomplete answers to all three. <laughs> um, I'm drawing examples primarily from direct effects on West Coast nearshore environments. So what we know about the West Coast, the California Current System and Puget Sound, that's my focus. So this is not a global review. There's not time to do a global review. Um, and it would, yeah, it's beyond the scope. Um, and I'm going to try and emphasize new work that's not published uh, by students <coughs> and postdocs wherever I can. Okay, so that's my approach. It leaves a lot out. And so please recognize that I'm not, you know, intentionally ignoring that work. I'm just not presenting it. Um, so let me start this way. What we know, we know this, that the rate of change in ocean pH is unprecedented in the last 25 million years. Um, ocean pH has bounced around over the last 25 million years between about 8 and 8.3 for a brief time. And since the dawn of the industrial era, it has plummeted. Um, this work comes from uh, PML. Uh, in the UK, it's robust work, and this is the picture to keep in your mind. We also know this, that the pH of the California current system is projected to decline. So Kristen Marshall and her colleagues at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center published a nice paper, I think, last year, well, 2017, yeah, last year now, um, in which they modeled pH, um, and here I've just taken a snapshot of two of their panels, but pH at the surface in August 2013 was about 8.0, and pH at the surface in 2063 is projected to be about 7.9. Now that's only one point difference, or one unit difference in pH, um, but that's mean pH, and that's mean pH on a log scale, and it obscures a lot of um, variation that occurs at other scales. So, for example, we know from the work of Dick Feely and his colleagues that spatial variation um, in carbonate system parameters along the West Coast is substantial. So here what you're seeing is aragonite saturation. I've switched from pH to aragonite saturation state. They are uh, not identical, but uh, they are related. Aragonite saturation states of less than one are thought to be corrosive to most shell-forming organisms. And even aragonite saturation states of less than about two can be corrosive. And what you see here, these are measurements. This is not modeled data. Uh, these are measurements from cruises, and the cruises are represented by the black dots, that in 2013, omega aragonite um, varied along the West Coast, it was as high as, you know, three in many areas, but in some areas at the surface, Columbia River, the Newport line, um, it was one or below. And certainly at 25 meters depth, you can see that even in 2013, there was very little water that was not undersaturated with respect to omega. So that means, in, uh, I think Dick Feely would describe this as, all that kind of pinkish reddish water is corrosive to shell forming organisms. So, undersaturation is already occurring. 
and it's spatially variable. What else do we know? We know that temporal variation along the west coast is substantial. Uh, so for instance, I just pulled one panel from a recent publication from, uh, by Francis Chan and his colleagues uh, showing uh, pH, so we're back to pH, and I apologize for you know, moving back and forth between pH, PCO2, aragonite saturation state, different authors report these variables you know, differentially, and, and so I'm reporting in the same units they do. Uh, so pH on the total scale um, between April 2016 and, no, sorry, April 16 of 2013 and September 13 of that same year. So here we have a several month span. You can see the change, the real sharp uh, temporal variation in, in pH. And that is consistent between intertidal sites and the inner shelf at about 25 meters. I think they took those measurements on the inner shelf. Um, you can also see that some of these values are really critically low. So 7.9, 7.7. So here's some water that's really highly corrosive or very low pH, and again here. So again, we're seeing critically low values. Um, that was in 2013. Things are probably even more extreme now. Okay, that's the physical setting. We're kind of done with chemistry for a while. Um, biological effects. Well, we know that biological effects occur across all critical life processes, multiple trophic levels, and multiple habitats. So this is work, um, it's old now, by Christy Croker. It's a meta-analysis that she performed and she published in 2013. It has since been corroborated by lots of studies. I've got a couple examples here. Um, showing that the mean effect size of near future acidification on biological response variables, like what's going to happen, um, tends to be negative for survival, calcification, growth, development, and abundance. And this is across taxa. These are predominantly invertebrate taxa because the fishes in 2013 um, had not been adequately studied um, is still pretty much the case. And the photosynthetic organisms tend to behave a little differently than this. Uh, but in general, the responses are negative. We know also that fished species show negative responses. So now we're going from the world of sort of all invertebrates to the world of uh, fished species. Uh, this is a, a paper published by Whitman and Fortner, uh, also in 2013, and it shows um, positive, neutral, and negative effects across different really broad taxonomic groups. So we have echinoderms, mollusks, crustaceans, and fishes. Um, these, these plots do include some, some taxa that are not fished, but they are in larger taxonomic groups that are fished. And you can see that, uh, that negative responses are detectable even at uh, PCO2 levels. So this is, now we're back, now we're at the PCO2, so we've got a new variable here. Um, of 500 to 600 microatmospheres and also six, 650 to 850 microatmospheres. These negative effects start cropping up at pretty low values of PCO2. And we're already seeing those low values of PCO2 in the California current system, at least sometimes, okay? So these aren't really future values in this range, these, these lower figures. These are what we're seeing today. We know that multiple life processes are affected in among the fish species. So again, work from Christie that's um, sort of sliced in a very different way shows that survival, calcification, and growth rate all show negative responses um, across mollusks, echinoderms, and crustaceans with respect to low PCO, or high PCO2 and low pH. So we've got 
effects across taxa, we've got effects across uh, life processes. We also know um, from the work of Jen Sunday, who's been done some really nice um, work in, in one of these working groups that I've, I've been um, associated with, that the intrinsic sensitivity rate varies by taxon. I mean, not a surprise, you might guess that, but she's been able to show that certain taxa, and here, for example, pink salmon um, and red urchins have a higher intrinsic sensitivity to elevated PCO2 than some other taxa, such as seagrasses or maybe sea stars. We also know that direct effects, I mean, from lots and lots of literature, and I've only reported or um, mentioned just a few selected publications here, um, the direct effects on calcified species, calcified invertebrates, um, include changes in calcification rate and changes in energetics. Um, so mussels, oysters, um, uh, crabs, including both Dungeness crab and some of the Alaska crabs, and echinoderms all show um, sensitivity in terms of calcification and where we have evidence in terms of energetics. So it's very energetically costly for organisms to, um, to sort of deal with the effects of uh, low pH and high CO2. And then finally, Almost finally, um, we know that direct effects on fish are very different. They include behavioral changes. This is a sort of surpri was surprising when it was first um, reported several years ago by Phil Mundy and his group in in Australia. Most of the evidence comes from tropical fish, uh, but in tropical fish, it's been repeatedly demonstrated that olfaction is impaired, homing is impaired, um, auditory responses are impaired. Uh, a tropical fish cannot sense their, like their home ranges, their nooks and crannies. They can't sense their uh, predators and they can't sense their prey. That's, um, that's sobering. Uh, what do we know about Temperate fish and the temperate fish we care about in Washington, uh, salmon. We are beginning to learn from the work of Chase Williams that predator de detection is effective in juvenile coho salmon. So new work by Chase, I don't know if Chase is here, um, that is kind of uh, an, a joint effort between the Washington Ocean Acidification Center and Sea Grant and the Northwest Fishery Science Center shows that uh, at, let's see, it shows that um, in, did I reverse these? I did, that's why I'm confused. Okay, so this is, this is your second lesson in proofreading. <laughs> these are reversed. This should be pH 7.8 and this should be pH 7.2. That Then the plot makes a lot more sense. <laughs> uh, so, under conditions of high PCO2, go with the word and not the number, um, that salmon lose um, their avoidance, uh, their sense of avoiding those um, odorants that are expressed by their predators, okay? So it's the first evidence of um, a behavioral, a negative behavioral response to ocean acidification in salmon from a local species. Uh, Chase is continuing this work. He is now um, doing some really nice neural work to, to essentially examine the neural networks that are responsible for this. But for those that, for whom um, this is kind of new information, the behavioral responses in fish to low, high pH, sorry, low pH and high PCO2, um, are mediated through um, neuronal networks that are governed by GABA, gamma amino butyric acid, and those pathways 
So it's very, very different than the response uh, by invertebrates, let's say, with respect to calcification or healing. Okay, so predator detection is affected in juvenile coho salmon, but very curiously, Chase has worked with, um, he's done the same experiments with, uh, with sable fish, juvenile sable fish, and found no detectable response. So fish respond differently. The same sort of difference ha was reported by uh, researchers in California for rockfish. So here we have, um, we have data from copper rockfish on the left and blue rockfish on the right, and they're conveniently color-coded. Um, and copper rockfish show a negative response to uh, high PCO2. And again, it's a behavioral response. They, their aerobic scope declines, they lose lateralization, and their critical swimming speeds decline, whereas blue rockfish show no detectable response. So again, differences between taxa in their response to these um, stressors. Okay, so kind of a brief summary of where we're at, what we know is that corrosive conditions already occur on the West Coast. Those conditions are projected to worsen. Fish species of diverse taxa are negatively affected. Various life processes are negatively affected. And sensitivity and response varies by taxon. Okay. What can we expect? Well, we don't know. <laughs> uh, I am gonna use harmful algal blooms as sort of an indication of what we can expect in terms of ocean acidification impacts to fisheries. And the reason I'm gonna do this is threefold. One is we simply don't have the data, um, we don't have information on the effects of ocean acidification on fisheries. We have, we're beginning to get data on the effects of ocean acidification on fish, but not yet on fisheries. Secondly, uh, we know that harmful algal blooms are expected to become more frequent and more severe under conditions of ocean change. So as the ocean changes, harmful algal blooms become more frequent and more severe. This is one example, and there are others in the literature. Um, I've taken this. This is a modeled trend in bloom season uh, for Alexandrium and Dinophysis from 1982 to 2016. What it shows is that blooms are getting longer, not by much, but significantly longer, by a day or two or maybe three, and that the growth rates, uh, the intrinsic growth rate is also increasing. Okay, there are other data that show other metrics that uh, indicate that blooms will become more frequent and more severe. It's also the case, and this is really curious to me, someone who you now know has a degree in botany, um, that harmful algae grow faster and are more toxic under OA conditions. And that is not intuitive. It's certainly not intuitive to a botanist. Uh, but that has been repeatedly demonstrated now since the work of, I think the, the original work came out of um, a Dave Hutchins' lab at USC. It's now been repeated by many other labs for many species that toxin production increases under ocean acidification conditions. Uh, what's even more curious is that both diatoms and dinoflagellates exhibit this response. And so maybe only the phycologists in the room know how different diatoms and dinoflagellates are. They don't do anything the same. Um, but they respond to OA in approximately the same manner. Okay, also to note as we go through this, diatoms produce domoic acid, and that, I know you guys know this, that domoic acid tag has nothing to do with acidification, right? They're separate things. Um, dinoflagellates produce paralytic shellfish toxin. Okay, so the implications of this for Washington shell fisheries are really clear. 
I mean, if you talk to the shellfish growers and you tell them that HABs will get worse under OA, I mean, they're already worried about OA, right? And now if you tell them HABs will get worse under OA, that's, that's um, of concern to them. We know that Washington produces a lot of product, that it, that product um, uh, produces a lot of revenue for the state, and especially for small coastal communities, um, and they provide a lot of jobs. So the socioeconomic consequences of losses due to harmful algal blooms associated uh, with ocean acidification are, um, are negative. Okay, so work that I'm doing with others at the Northwest Fishery Science Center and here at UW shows, first of all, that fisheries harvest closures have occurred each year on the West Coast. And again, we're West Coast focused. Fisheries harvest closures have occurred each year from 2005 to 2016. And for those in the back that might not be able to read this, these, this is uh, Demoic acid produced by diatoms on the left and PSP produced by dinoflagellates on the right. Um, and these plots go from Morro Bay in the south to La Push in the north and from 2005 to 2016. And here what you can see is that there were big blooms in 2005 um, in certain places and again in 2015 and 16 <coughs> of Demoic acid. And then you can see that there were sort of persistent or consistent blooms of PSP um, in other years. It's very interesting that uh, the really extreme <coughs> bloom conditions of demoic acid and PSP that would close fisheries tend to alternate. They don't tend to co-occur at the same time. Um, perhaps, you might speculate, because diatoms and dinoflagellates are responding to different factors in ocean condition. But nevertheless, the communities, if you look across this way, you know, the communities are seeing closures due to one or the other source um, in almost every year. We also know that West Coast communities are unevenly affected by these closures. So for the communities that have been looked at, um, you can see that some, especially at the edges of the ranges, are relatively less impacted than some right in the middle of the range. So there's an uneven distribution across communities. In 2015, probably many of you remember that uh, there was sort of the biggest ever toxic algal bloom along the West Coast and it shut down shell fisheries in Washington, Oregon, and California. And those, those closures were dire. They really, they lasted a long time. They were unprecedented. They caused a lot of grief in the communities. We then asked, kind of following on the heels of those closures, we asked about the socioeconomic effects of these HAB-induced closures on the West Coast. And we uh, focus pre pre primarily on the recreational razor clam fishery and the commercial crab fish um, fishery. Uh, we used in a group, um, Stacia Dreyer was uh, really instrumental in much of this work. We, uh, we had the students first do interviews in communities. And then from those um, interviews, we constructed a survey instrument and we surveyed even more communities to get a, a pretty robust sample of the impacts to um, communities across the West Coast. So just a couple of examples of where we landed, what we found in terms of economic impacts. The interview data suggests that these are quotes from the interviews, the two the 2000 2015 closures led to the first time ever I've had to borrow money against my property to pay my property taxes and my fish and game licensing. People were really stressed economically. Um, and there were cascading impacts that went from the fishery sector 
to, let's say, the recreational sector, the hospitality sector, other sectors in the community. So for instance, somebody from outside the fishing community said, the 2015 HAB event affected everybody. It doesn't matter if their family has a fisherman or not, if they have a local small business around here, they're going to get affected. So these communities really, um, uh, uh, I would say, suffered during this time. In terms of sociocultural impacts, um, a couple of the comments were these, that we gather around razor climbing days or we go crabbing together as part of an ident uh, identification <coughs> point for why we live here. Lots of people reported that crabbing was central to their identity. And they then further reported that to lose that social interaction that binds our community together was a problem. Somebody else commented that you can read Facebook posts from crabbers' wives and you can tell it's not good in the household. Um, and then somebody else said, it was pretty stressful, the whole thing. I grew gray hairs. I mean, it was really bad. Okay, so those were um, comments and those comments were corroborated by many, many other comments and corro corroborated by the results of our broader um, survey of communities. Um, these were all conducted in non-tribal communities. And the interviews were con conducted with non-tribal um, individuals. But there was an Igert group consisting of four students, Kate Crossman and three uh, SAF students, so Merrill and Eleni and Mike Tillotson. And they essentially did, they did a similar study. So they did it before we did. They got out in front of us. Um, they went out and talked to people on the Quinault Reservation about these similar concerns. Their study was more broadly couched in terms of ocean change and the tribal concerns with ocean change sort of writ broad, not focused on HABs specifically or on OA specifically. But what they found is that there were concerns identified that by the Quinault. There were concerns identified by non-tribal members outside the Quinault and that there were many shared concerns. And at the top of that list is harmful algal blooms. Next down is climate change that many people sort of conflate with OA. I want to point out that climate change is not ocean acidification, and ocean acidification is not climate change, but they often are conflated. Um, and then disease, which is also associated with a warming ocean and sometimes with, um, yeah, well, with uh, a warming ocean. So the, tri the responses that tribes gave are really consistent with the responses that were given by uh, non-tribal communities and non-tribal entities. Um, if anything, the tribes are probably more affected or likely to be more affected um, than some of the non-tribal communities. So we see a consistency in response. Um, our survey went all the way from Washington to California, and we see consistency across that range. Okay, so if we, if we use that lesson of harmful algal blooms that may be associated with growing OA in Washington, um, what might we expect? And I think three things. Uh, fisheries closures due to changing ocean conditions are likely to cause socioeconomic shocks to coastal communities, that health and well-being in these communities will, will be affected, um, and that communities differ in their exposure, risk, and resilience to these shocks. And this last bullet is something that um, a group of us are now trying to investigate um, a little more closely. So Eddie Allison and Julia Ekstrom and Stephanie Moore um, and Kathleen Moore are all working hard to, to really look more closely at exposure, risk, and resilience in these communities. Okay, so what can we do? The, li <laughs> the list is short, and um, I am going to just touch on three, um, three potential strategies uh, for addressing ocean acidification as it relates to fisheries. So first, vegetation <coughs> management or blue carbon strategies. Second, nutrient management. And third, fisheries management. 
So question number one, can aquatic vegetation reduce exposure to OA and shellfish trees? Anybody that listened to NPR yesterday, two days ago, um, was likely to hear a story about the lowly seagrass. Okay, as a botanist, I object to that, but. <laughs> um, the lowly seagrass that could save your oysters from climate change. Um, that was on KQED in San Francisco. Um, on KUOW, they asked, can seagrass sh save shellfish from climate change? And this is all over um, Oregon Public Broadcasting. And this stems, uh, this media attention stems partly from an upcoming event. Uh, so this is sort of n news in advance of an event. Uh, there's a hearing yes, uh, in California on uh, February 6th asking, or it's concerning aquatic ve vegetation as an ocean acidification management tool in California. California is going after this like gangbusters, um, the relationship between ocean acidification and the use of seagrass to ameliorate some of the negative effects. Very interesting to me also because California has lost more than 90% of its seagrass habitat. Um, but this, this is the reason for, the, uh, for a lot of the press. How does this play out in Washington? Let's, let's take a look. Um, first of all, another group of Igert students, um, Hallie Stone and Steve Pochedli and Laura Newcomb, uh, looked at uh, you know, this question several years ago. Um, and among the things they did is they mapped seagrass distribution in Puget Sound. I mean, others have done this. WDFW does it. Uh, DNR does it. But these guys mapped seagrass distribution in Puget Sound. And among the things that you know we can observe from the mapping is that, first of all, there's a really low ratio of seagrass biomass to, seagra to seawater volume. Like, there's not much seagrass, and there is a lot of water. <coughs> that, that might be a problem. Um, even though the water in Puget Sound, you know, Puget Sound's a semi-retentive basin and um, water here sticks around longer than it does on the coast of California. Um, there's an uneven distribution of seagrass in Puget Sound. Uh, it tends to be more abundant in the north and it's not very abundant in the south. Um, and that distribution creates a spatial mismatch with water conditions. So there's virtually no seagrass in South Puget Sound, which is way at the bottom. Um, but that's where the oyster industry operates, and that's where the <coughs> highest surface seawater values of PO, PCO2 are found. So there's more carbon dioxide in the water down there. There are more oysters down there, and there's no seagrass. OK, so there is a mismatch there. The promise to me is a little, you know, my, it's tempered. Um, so one of my students, Courtney Grainer, uh, asked whether adding vegetation or shell hash could improve conditions for uh, shellfish growth. This, these two strategies, adding vegetation, so like dumping um, seagrass or kelp onto, onto um, shellfish beds, or adding shellfish, let's say, from restaurants, other sources, have, were both proposed in the Blue Ribbon Panel Report as uh, strategies to mitigate CO, um, P, uh, declining seawater pH. What she found, I'm going to speed up because I'm going a little bit long, is that she found no effect of shell hash or, um, or vegetation uh, in trials across Padilla Bay and the Snohomish Delta. So no effect on clam growth in her studies. Another one of my students asked whether vegetated areas store more carbon than unvegetated areas. Like, is there more carbon yeah. in the soil? Does that, because that might reflect um, uh, one of the benefits of, of seagrass or vegetation. And the finding was that field sampling revealed no effect of vegetation on sediment carbon or carbon stock. And in fact, uh, Unvegetated areas at Padilla Bay stored more carbon in the sediment than those that were vegetated. Okay, that's contrary to expectation, I just have to say. 
However, there's conflicting evidence. WDFW, um, they have done some really wonderful work, Michael Hurwith down there and his, his colleagues. And their studies um, indicate that eelgrass can significantly increase pH in some nearshore environments really close to seagrass beds, that Pacific and Olympia oysters grew faster when eelgrass was around, and that oysters closer to eelgrass grew faster than oysters further away. Um, on the other hand, shellfish larvae showed no preference for eelgrass versus unvegetated habitats. So there are differences here. They're hard to explain. They could be at least partly a result of species-specific and location-specific responses. What about kelp? Work is underway in Puget Sound. Um, the pros of using kelp as um, a strategy to ameliorate OA are th is that kelp grows fast. It can create really high biomass. And besides that, it's beautiful. Um, the cons are that kelp is highly seasonal. And the seasonality of kelp doesn't necessarily match very well the seasonality of the most extreme acidification events. Um, Kelp carbon is highly refractile. So carbon's tied up in kelp for a while, and then it's back in the water, back in the atmosphere. Kelp in Puget Sound and on the Washington coast are habitat limited. Um, and kelp farming is labor intensive and really expensive. OK, what about nutrients? Uh, can nutrient management reduce exposure to OA in shell fisheries? Well, just a one note on that. Um, the State Department of Ecology and Greg Pelletier in particular have modeled nutrient inputs to Puget Sound. And again, this was something suggested by the Blue Ribbon Panel on Ocean Acidification. And what they have found is that nutrients, um, anthropogenic nutrients coming from the land do slightly reduce omega aragonite. So they make the water slightly more corrosive in some places. So not in the eastern basin of the um, Strait of Juan de Fuca, but let's say the central basin, um, South Sound. But those, change, those differences are really small. Um, and per, you know, questionably biologically meaningful. Can fisheries management address effects of OA? Well, you guys are the fisheries managers. Um, and I'm sure you have opinions about this. Uh, the way I um, see this is that, yeah, sure, fisheries management can go at least partway towards addressing the effects of OA. So the tax, total allowable catch, can be adjusted downwards as stock de stocks decline. Um, that's well within the purview of the um, of the council process. Um, Ecosystem-based management can be used to address food web effects. And I haven't talked at all about food web effects because we really don't know much about them. Uh, they're likely to occur, and we know very little. Uh, protections applied at appropriate scales can provide benefits to vulnerable species and vulnerable populations. So you can protect some species <coughs> in some places, at least for some length of time. And you can use fisheries management tools to do that. Um, management strategies can be expanded to preserve existing evolutionary potential. I think that is important for managers to recognize that we should preserve every ounce of evolutionary potential that we think exists. Um, and forecast models, for example, JScope that forecasts you know, a ways into the future, let's say weeks to months, and live ocean that forecasts ocean acidification conditions on very short-term timescales can provide information to support management decisions. Okay, so there are things that we can do now under existing management structures um, and decision-making sort of pathways to help address this. Are they fully adequate? Um, perhaps not. OK, so where does that leave us? It leaves us with lots of variation in the physical and biological systems. That's not a good place to be if you want to make decisions. And it leaves us with a ton of uncertainty. Again, these are not ideal conditions under which to make uh, 
decisions or policy interventions. At the same time, we know that global atmospheric CO2 levels are at record high and show no sign of declining. Uh, we also know that the ocean is r warming rapidly um, and that new last month, uh, 2017, was the warmest year on record for the global ocean. Uh, but we also know um, that we can choose between alternative futures. So this is a um, diagram that was produced by uh, John Pierre Gattuso and his colleagues, including Ryan Kelly, in advance of the Paris Climate Conference. And it's a little bit of a complicated diagram, but really what they are showing is that on the left, under conditions of lower CO2 emissions, you have more opportunities to adapt and to manage. <coughs> and as you move to the right and under higher CO2 conditions, you lose opportunities to adapt and manage. And so a prudent person would probably like to stay closer to the left. Doesn't say much about our federal government, but I won't go there today. Um, so to wrap up, um, just a short list of practical actions to benefit fisheries. This is my, you know, my two cents. Others would add other practical actions. I think this is not an exhaustive list. But first and foremost, reduce carbon emissions. Second, reduce co-occurring stressors. Temperature, nutrients, um, disturbance, uh, all sorts of land use factors, so co-occurring stressors just make the effects of ocean acidification worse. Preserve ecosystem processes, okay, admittedly easier said than done. Uh, preserve existing aquatic vegetation. That is, I think, a no regret scenario. Keep the vegetation we have now. Whether or not it's worth it to sort of plant more or to try and farm um, vegetation, if we keep what we have now, that that's a you know it's a good thing. Um, reduce disturbance to habitats that store carbon. I didn't have time to talk about this, but there is carbon stored in sediments throughout the marine environment. Leave it there, okay? Every time we, you know there there are some very nice papers that show that when you disturb uh, carbon bearing sediments, you just re-release re all that carbon into the environment. Um, so we can reduce disturbance. Um, and I think really importantly, we need to preserve evolutionary potential. We know very little about it. We know that from work that um, people here and people elsewhere have done that um, some of, uh, that there are genes under selection uh, with respect to ocean acidification or low pH. Um, we know that evolutionary potential exists in some reservoirs in places, and we know that it's variable, but we don't really know much more than that. I think we really need to be cautious and preserve the evolutionary potential that likely exists in places we, don't, we can't yet discern. So I'm gonna stop there, and I've got, minute, I've got time for a few questions. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I'd like to say I don't know, um, or we don't know, uh, but but we can we can start to chip away at that. So 
first of all, temperature, as, as experienced by organisms, tends to be much more highly variable across you know, a season, a year, whatever, a day, than, um, than some of the carbon system parameters. So, we're, the, so the temperature and OA are different in that respect. And there could be reason to believe that organisms are more <coughs> naive with respect to OA than they are with respect to temperature. Um, and there could be reason to expect that there is more evolutionary potential or genetic variation with respect to temperature that addresses temperature compared with OA. On the other hand, if you look at tide pools, where I spend a lot of my life you know, counting snails, which don't seem to matter, <laughs> um, uh, tide pools are not empty. Tide pools um, have broad excursions in temperature, in oxygen, which I didn't talk at all about, but oxygen is a big factor here, and then in carbon chemistry on really short time scales. And those environments are full of invertebrates, calcifying algae, and also fleshy algae. So that, that, that suggests to me that um, at least some things can tolerate and, uh, these conditions, and they likely have you know, potential for adaptation. Does that help? Yeah. Sure, up at the top. Right, so um, the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, um, addressed this, uh, and Ryan Kelly, I don't think Ryan's here, but Ryan has done some nice writing on this. First of all, we have, we, Washington and other states, have policies in place to regulate nutrient runoff. We, we have the mechanisms to, um, to manage that. Um, it is the case, it seems that we, there is good evidence from the um, Gulf of Mexico that nutrient runoff from the Mississippi River makes uh, you know, the whole pH, PCO2 thing a lot worse. What we're seeing in Washington is more equivocal. Uh, it's not clear. The, the, the added stress from the nutrients, um, the amount of stress added by those nutrients uh, is at this point um, questionable. But it is something we can manage, and it's something that even if it has minimal benefit on ocean acidification conditions, it's going to have benefit in other um, ways. For instance, through um, reducing eutrophication. So we, ha you know, with no new laws or regulations, we could more effectively manage nutrients simply by enforcing the regulations that now exist. Yeah, Chris. Ah, uh, yes. And, and how do you strike that, see that balance? And I guess I don't understand the mechanism through which releasing the pack is going to work and get us to a, an eventually sustainable level. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So, first of all, good thing you're the fisheries manager and not me. Um, so, but the way I'm thinking about it is, is that if and when there are substantial declines in abundance in, let's say, a particular stock, that the stock assessment process and then the tack that goes along with that will naturally come down, right? And so that's what I was thinking. If you see um, sharp declines in, um, let's say, a 
fished stock, the existing process will automatically, well, I say automatically, lower the tack. And that will cause socioeconomic uh, disruption, certainly. Um, but the mechanism is there to do that. Um, it doesn't necessarily sustain the, well, what does it do? It sustains the fish long enough to maybe, you know, who knows, rebuilding in an age of, in an era of ocean acidification might be more difficult. I don't know. Christine. Yeah, um, and different communities responded differently. Uh, I think that the data <laughs> indicate that younger people were less likely to go into the fishery and younger people were more likely to leave. I mean, people that might have been in the fishery only a couple years were likely to leave um, the f and do something entirely different. Um, diversifying their, their sort of income is, is difficult. Um, in some of these communities, and partly because if you don't, if you're not fishing, you might be working for a restaurant that serves fish, but not or crab, and there's now no crab on the menu, right? Or you might be selling clamming gear or crabbing gear that now nobody's buying. So um, what we did observe is that in several communities, the options to respond were really limited. People in some cases noted that they were moving away. That wasn't a common response. People are very tightly tied to their communities. And I think one of the real regrets that we uh, heard from the interviews is that people saw their communities as really, really losing a lot of what they perceived as their cultural, um, uh, I don't know, benefit, their, their cultural identity. And, uh, but they weren't willing to leave their communities. Good, que good question, and I have couched this in terms of evolutionary potential, but it's really about adaptive potential in general um, because I know this doesn't quite answer your question, but it's a hopeful answer is that, um, again, something I didn't have time to talk about, ocean acidification studies in the laboratory are really tough to do. Um, and most studies are very brief, let's say two weeks, maybe four weeks. Um, there have been a few studies that have gone on for, let's say, a year with the same organisms in this, under the same conditions. And some of those experiments have shown that the longer you keep an organism under conditions of low pH, high pCO2, sort of the better they do. At first they do very poorly, and then they start to maybe do a little better. And that's a plastic response, it's not an evolutionary response. But that sort of bodes well. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, there are known to be carryover effects. Uh, and so this has also been really well demonstrated. So if you expose a parent to ocean acidification uh, and then remove that stress and don't expose the offspring to ocean acidification, they still can show um, depressed or impaired behavior. So, yeah, don't know. Well, that was our last burning question. <laughs> Did Sam have any questions? No, no. <laughs> uh, we have <laughs> so the last question I'll try and be short. Okay. Last yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, seagrass is, I mean, in this region, seagrass 
uh, is thought to be important. It's suggested to be important. We haven't, we really could learn more about the importance of seagrass and then kelp. Those are the two um, that have along the entire <coughs> west coast that are, seem to have the most promise to address this problem. 